Ah, well, okay, we're ready. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the May 19th meeting of the Merrimack Trustees of Trust Funds. I'm Chris Christensen. We'll introduce everybody. To my right is Bill Wilkes, trustee. And my left, Liz Petridi is trustee. And Tom Boland, finance director. And joining us from Cambridge Trust, if you introduce yourselves, that would be helpful. Eric Jusome, portfolio manager. Lindsay Denovan, investment analyst. Lisa Toronto, relations. Okay, thank you all very much for being here. First order of business is the minutes of April meeting, April uh, 21st. Do we have a motion? to approve the minutes as written on April uh, 21st. Okay. Second. Any discussion, omissions, corrections? No. no. Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Liz? Aye. 300. Zero, zero. And Next order of business is a portfolio review uh, from Cambridge Trust Company. And Lisa, are you going to make the introductions or where's, where's your plan? I was going to talk about the markets and the economy, um, about the portfolios. And I know there's some questions on CDs and obviously what's going on in the banking sector. So we can get to those um, at the end of the presentation. Um, but just to you know, start. Obviously, the markets have a nice had a nice rebound compared to 2022. Um, through yesterday, the S&P 500 um, was up, you know, 8.3 percent. Um, but interesting that rally is not as broad based as those numbers would lead you to believe. Um, the Nasdaq is up 20 percent, and more income focused benchmark that we use for your portfolio, the Nasdaq U.S. Broad Dividends Dividends Achiever Index is basically up 0.06 percent or flat for the year. Um, so even within the S and P hundred, ninety percent of the return of the from those of the market is coming from ten stocks, and mostly the ten mega cap tech stocks and you know the largest mega cap weighted stocks in the index, really driving those returns. So the rally has not been as broad based as expected. Um, obviously, you know the Fed continues to raise interest rates; they're in a range right now between five to five and a quarter percent. So in the last 12 months, they've raised interest rates over 500 basis points. So one of the most aggressive rate campaigns in our history. And you're starting to see the economy is starting to slow a little bit. Inflation is still high, running close to 5%. And again, the Fed is targeting 2-ish percent, probably going to get, you probably won't get to 2, probably get closer to 3. Um, the market, if you look at, you know, the Fed futures curve is indicating the, they're expecting the Fed to cut rates later this year. Uh, we don't think that's going to happen. Um, it's hard to root inflation at 5% and the unemployment rate is at 3.4%. So this is probably, you know, the news media is really hyping this potential reflation, uh, recession that we're having, going to have at some point later this year into early next year. This is the most hype inflate, um, recession. Again, it's hard to get a hard recession when you have strong unemployment and the economy is still growing. Um, you know, and you know the GP, GDP forecast for second quarter is going to be above two percent. And again, first quarter grew at one point one percent, but you had a two point three percent decline from inventory. So you're going to have an inventory rebuild, which will help to keep GDP strong. So we're not in the view we're going to have a hard recession. Uh, we do think we'll have a softening probably later this year into early next year, but definitely not a recession. Um, again, a lot of it's going to be predicated on the data going forward. Um, you know, the biggest obstacle facing the markets right now is the debt ceiling. Um, expectations are we anticipate that we will not have a default um, in the true sense of a default. Um, the U.S. government, if they go into what it's going to called a technical default, meaning they're going to miss the interest payments and principal payments, there is the full intent that once the debt ceiling is passed, that they will make good on, on the past obligations that they weren't able to pay. Uh, we don't think this is going to be the magnitude of a, of a real default that's going to cause you know, massive destructions within the financial markets. But if we get closer to you know, the June 1st, which is right now considered the X date, there will be more turmoil in the markets um, until, the, you know, the resolution is passed. Um, 
President Biden is flying home from from Japan this Sunday. Um, it looks like talks are progressing. Uh, but again, back in 2011, you know, when we had the last debt ceiling um, debate, you know, we didn't go into technical default as they were able to stop funding certain government programs in order to make the interest payments. You, you may remember, you know, trash was piling up in D.C., the national parks were closed. So there are some other mechanisms that the government can do to continue to pay their interest in uh, debt obligations. And I think that's the intent of, of Janet Yellen right now, make sure we don't miss any debt payments, which would put the U.S. government into a default. Uh, but that's another headwind facing the markets right now. But, you know, the market is expecting the Fed to cut rates. As I said earlier, we don't think the market is, you know, the market's ahead of the Fed. Uh, you know, the economy is not falling off a cliff just yet based on what we're seeing today. So we're anticipating more of a softish landing. But the Fed's staying on pause to root out inflation. Um, you know, you're starting to see, you know, unemployment is starting to increase a little bit, but not to the levels that would warrant, you know, seeing the unemployment rate increase in the four to five percent. Again, we're at three point four percent. You probably won't go much lower. But again, we move to four percent. It's still by historical standards, a very low unemployment rate. Um, higher interest rates are having, you know, an impact on tightening, you know, lending standards by the banks. Um, the banking sector has been in tor turmoil this year. Um, a lot of that's been because of the Fed raising interest rates 500 basis points. We've had three bank failures, uh, but at least the Westpac banking has seen actually increase in deposits this week. So that, that's a good sign. And again, a lot of the bank failures are due to, you know, investing investment portfolios that were very, very long. So, you know, reached for yield in a time where there wasn't a lot of yield and interest rates up 500 basis points. The mark to market losses on their available for sale portfolios were in the billions of dollars. So we don't think it's a system wide issue like we saw back in 2008, 2009 during the great financial crisis. We think this is more isolated. But again, all banks are being brushed, you know, the same due to the fact that interest rates have increased so much. Uh, and you know, bank earnings are going to be under a little bit of pressure. We have the inverted yield curve. Um, so again, short rates higher than long rates. Historically, that has led to an economic slowdown. But again, we've also had a lot of government interventions in the yield curve for the last several years. So it's really hard to say if that 210 inversion is because of an economic slowdown or just because of government manipulations. Um, but again, so the markets have been stronger this year, um, off to a better start than we were last year. Um, and the portfolios have basically performed right in line with the net, with the more of a dividend focused benchmark. Um, portfolios are very underweight technology. Again, all stocks in the portfolio are paying dividends. You know, the dividend yields continue to increase. I'll just jump ahead here to the next page. Um, Hang on before you do that. Sure. Just on the overall, does anybody have any? I have a couple of comments or questions. But anybody else have anything they want to say first? I'm good right now. Thanks. I yes, go ahead, Chris. A couple of thoughts. Thank you. The I'm going to call them traditional thought process about recession or non-recession uh, seems to be escaping me a little bit. In my mind, going from a Dow of 36,000 to a Dow of 33,000 is... I don't want to say recession, but it's certainly a pullback in the markets. And I think it's going to be a long time before we regain that 10% that uh, loss in the Dow. And I'm looking at uh, interest rates going up. And because we're dividend focused, although we've, we've been shifting into more fixed income lately, which is a good move, thank you. Um, as interest rates increase, that's going to cut into earnings, and I see that impacting uh, dividends, not necessarily cuts in dividends, but certainly dividend growth is less likely to continue. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, as you, as you move along, you don't have to answer those things now, but as you move along, I'd like to hear how your thinking goes in our portfolio uh, for those factors. Sure. Um... Yeah, we look at the valuations, the market as a whole. Um, so right now, I, you can characterize, we look at the S&P 500, it's you know, more broad-based 500 companies. Um, if you look at you know, valuations right now on the P multiple, not overly expensive, not really cheap, kind of trading near a 10-year average. But if you factor out those 10 you know, mega cap stocks, s and is trading about 14 times earnings. So you could say there's a little distortion because of the larger mega cap stocks that have really driven the returns this year. 
Then you look at the subsectors. So last year was a really good year for dividend paying stocks as the, you can almost say last year the market was pricing in the recession. And this year it's sort of not pricing in the recession as you've seen more of that pivot from value stocks, which you know, more dividend paying stocks, which led the charge last year to more growth stocks this year. And the portfolio focuses more on those dividend paying stocks, as you mentioned earlier. Q1 earnings were actually decent. Um, you know, they missed, they guided a little bit lower and actually exceeded the lower guidance. And so that's where the big debate in the market right now, you know, we had an, our own internal asset allocation meeting yesterday where we're not, you know, we're underweight equities. Your portfolios, as, as you mentioned, we've actually trimmed stocks to buy bonds at higher yields. So by our own asset allocation targets, we're about a 4% plus, you know, 4% underweight equities. And we're maintaining that underweight. We just think there's possibility of, you know, we're finding better opportunities in the market, but, you know, there's been this big pendulum swing to start the year and a lot of stocks that we had on our radar just got overpriced, especially in the technology sector in general. So, you know, you look at a lot of those defensive sectors, which led the charge last year, they're underperforming. So you look at the top performing sectors for 2022 are your most underperforming sectors to start this year. Again, it's a short window. It's four months into the year, but it just shows you how quickly money has moved in and out of these sectors. Um, so the more defensive sectors, healthcare is underperforming this year, finance is underperforming, utilities is underperforming, but technology is really outperforming this year. Energy, which was one of the biggest winners last year, is underperforming this year. So to, to get back to answer your question, you know, we, you know, the stocks in the portfolio, we believe they're in, anticipate that their dividends are secure. Um, you know, the payout ratios are reasonable. They're not paying 100% of earn of, you know, earnings as dividends. So we believe those are secure. Um, and we, at the margin, we've started a shift over the last 12 months, more out of equities and into fixed income to take advantage of the higher yields. Um, we're probably going to look to, you know, trim some stocks next week and use those proceeds to add more to bonds as, you know, we're, we you can't predict where interest rates are going, but we're close to or just underneath a 10 year high. So we're above, I'm sorry, a 10 year average high. So we're near the high of interest rates. And, you know, you start looking at, you know, what could cause, you know, more turmoil in the markets. And we look at credit spreads where, you know, both high yield and investment grade credit spread. So credit spread is the incremental risk premium that you earn above a treasury. And as those spreads widen, that's usually a sign of distress in the markets. And we've seen a little bit of widening, but not to the point that would look at, you know, okay, yeah, the bond market or the credit markets are now saying that you know, the economy is going to start cratering. Um, but, you know, companies over the last, you know, I'd say three to five years due to the low interest rate environment raised a lot of capital via the debt markets at historically low interest rates and termed out that debt. Um, so they have a lot of debt termed out. So even though you could see, you know, a slowdown in corporate earnings uh, expectations in the corporate bond market, that companies' leverages aren't going to increase all that much. Interest coverage ratios are still going to be solid. So... It's really it's a really bifurcated market right now where the bond market, especially the U.S. Treasury market by the shape of the yield curve, is forecasting an economic oh, wow. slowdown. Equity markets sold off last year. You could say this year with the rally, they've kind of looked forward. Again, the stock market tends to be forward looking. So you can say the market, the equity market is kind of looking, OK, maybe it's a slowdown, but we're not ultimately concerned at present. Um, especially if you look at some of the valuations in tech. I know one stock we talked about the last meeting, NVIDIA, you know, stocks up over well over 100% this year because of their artificial intelligence and chat GBT, all the markets they're involved in. But the stock's trading 100 times earnings. Um, so, you know, there's definitely some overvaluation. You could say some of the defensive sectors from last year became overvalued. They've sold off this year. So the valuations in some of those defensive sectors aren't as extreme as they were last year. Uh, so hopefully that answers you know most of your question. Yeah. So not to get ahead of you, but uh, what sectors would you you said you'd be doing some trimming in the next short term? Yeah. Uh, what sectors would you be trimming, and what kind of maturities would you be looking at in the if you're headed towards fixed income? We're probably looking in the five year area, five to seven year area where we're finding, you know, that's where you have the, you know, have the inversion of the curve. Um, and we think the five year is going to have a nice roll down. Um, it's really hard to predict 
rates going out more than a year. Um, but we think, you know, the five years are really sweet spot right now. Um, you know, look at the five year Pfizer deal that came earlier this week was in the mid four plus percent yield, probably four and a half to four point seven percent yield looks really attractive. And because of the inversion of the curve, you go out further and you're actually losing yields. So we think the five year is a reasonable place to be. And we typically run our portfolios. What about a four year duration or average? You could say, you know, interest rate risk profile about four years, what we think is a, a good spot to be, especially for income principal, the non-capital reserve accounts, which have their own shorter, much shorter maturities. And probably looking to trim some more finance. Um, you know, JPM has, has had actually done very well this year. It's actually has a positive return, but we're, in general, we're more concerned about the banking sector as we think the yield curve inversion will persist longer. You've seen a lot of deposits have come out of the regionals and into the super region, into the, you know, the mega money center banks such as JP Morgan and Bank of America. We did trim a little PNC earlier, probably take a little more out of the, out of the finance sector, where again, the yields are not as high as you'd expect them to be and roll them into more, you know, industrial and corporate type of bonds. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else before we move on? I mean, in the media and so forth, you hear a lot about the banks, you know, going forward and mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of consolidation and so forth. And when you talk about J.P. Morgan or, or uh, Bank of America, or any of the top mega banks, yeah. you know, they're going to, according to everything you hear, they're going to be the 800-pound gorillas. I'm not sure why you would trim those. Just the valuations. Um, well, the valuations aren't that high. I mean, yields are they, also not that high as well. So you look at to the me. Yield. To me, the whole banking sector is depressed because of everything that's gone on. You know, I'm kind of a contrarian. I would be buying banks, not selling banks. Yeah, we based still have. Yeah, fact. understood. But we, we're, our, our view is, you know, it's. Near term, there's going to be more margin pressure. So even though, you know, Bank of America and, you know, especially J.P. Morgan, you know, basically acquiring First Republic for, you know, a, you know, very steep discount, um, you know, a lot of the money that's flowed into there and, you know, yield curve normalizes a lot of that deposit money will start to flow back, we think, into a lot of the regionals and back, you know. So our, our view is, you know, some of the pricing right now, especially in J.P. Morgan, it's it's expensive, um, considering there's still more risk um, going forward, even though they're, quote unquote, systematically too big to fail, they are much bigger than they were last year at this time. So there's a lot of concern in the banking sector. And we're looking to probably trim some of that right now, not outright sale it, you know, we're still going to have some, but just look to trim a little bit of that off the table right now. So with all of that in mind, um, since we're a yield focused portfolio, um, the yields on the banks are going to be questionable, shall we say. Uh, at what point in time would you anticipate rebalancing back into that? Not, not necessarily in time, but in uh, fiscal stability for, the, for that sector. We'd look for more stability to increase the weights um, going forward. That's probably, I, you can't predict going forward, but right now, uh, I'm just going to, if you don't mind, I'm just going to turn to the next slide here just to show, you know, the y overall yields, how much these yields have increased over the last several quarters and years. Um, if you go back to, you know, almost two years ago, you know, most of the yields in these portfolios are well up over 100 basis points. And a lot of that is coming from not just the equities, some of the repositioning that we did, but also from the bonds taking advantage of the higher interest rates that are now available. Um, you know, you look back to, you know, back in, you know, January of 2020, the bond yield was 3.2%. It's 100 basis points more today. Um, and again, it, we're not going out and buying extremely long bonds. We're not locking in 30 year, but we did buy some 10 year debt. Um, so but we think right now the sweet spot is more of that five year part of the yield curve. Um, so to answer your question, we'd look for a little more stability um, in the banking sector um, before we would increase the weights again. But again, we're still, we're not going you know, we're not going to a zero weight. We're still going to have J.P. Morgan and Bank of America in the portfolio, just looking to reduce it a little bit. Okay, let's press on then, if that's okay with everybody. Um, just, yeah, yeah, just to highlight, you know, this page up here just shows you, you know, the overall yields of the portfolio continue to increase. Uh, for principal and income, closing in on a total portfolio yield of about 4%, just under, you know, 
3.9 and 3.87. Uh, performance, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the performance of the portfolio is basically in line with the, you know, the, the benchmark, which is the NASDAQ US Broad Dividend Achievers Index. You know, the benchmark return was 2.9, the portfolio is between 2.6 to 2.5, so a little bit behind. Again, some of that just a little bit of positioning and some of the weights that we had. Um, Bond returns were a little bit behind the benchmark. Um, so much like you saw in the equity markets where what underperformed last year outperformed this year. Last year, you know, higher credit quality outperformed. This year, triple Bs are outperforming single A's and double A's, and we're very overweight to higher credit quality. Um, again, turnover has been lower in the portfolio compared to years past. Um, again, most of the trades have been, you know, some within the equity sleeve, but also more of trimming stocks to add to bonds, as I mentioned earlier. And the cap reserve portfolios, again, those are managed for safety of principle um, and with maturities and with cash flow, as we've been rolling out more to that one to three to four year, obviously we're increasing yields substantially compared to they were a couple of years ago where it was very hard to get 1%. Now we're looking at three, four, 5% type yields available in that short part of the curve. Um, I know there were some questions on CDs from, from a prior email. Uh, we can go over those right now um, if you want. Sure. Um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Lindsay to talk about the CDs. Sure. Thank you. Um, so not to read off of the slide as it's up there, uh, but there was a question around the FDIC insurance coverage for the, FD, uh, for the CDs within the portfolios. Um, all of the CDs within the portfolios have a cap of 250,000 per issuer, um, which allows for coverage within the FDIC insurance program. Uh, that's something that we monitor on an ongoing basis before we put any new money to work within any of the portfolios. We, we look across everything for the Merrimack holdings um, to make sure we stay within those limits. Um, when we do uh, initiate purchases, we also check uh, several ratings agencies before we we make a purchase to make sure that they meet our minimum standards. Um, on an ongoing basis, quarterly, we do also uh, do ongoing monitoring to make sure that those ratings are, are comfortably where we want to see them. Um, because we do have the FDIC insurance coverage, if a bank were to default, we do have an avenue to go to recoup um, the, the principal at that point. Um, so we, we are very uh, uh, um, focused on this and, and in ensuring that the capital reserve portfolios maintain those maximum exposures um, to make sure that, that we don't reach that FDIC insurance limit. So the heavy weighting of the capital reserve funds is CDs. Yes. That's fine. The other side of that is some of them, especially this time of year when we're getting ready to spend all this money, um, there's a lot of it in cash. Yes. So where's the cash protected, if you will? So we utilize a money market fund. Um, we also go more conservative within our money market products. Uh, we use the Federated Hermes Government Obligations Fund, um, which utilizes governments and government agencies, no repurchases within this uh, particular money fund that we use. Um, it has a dollar NAV stable uh, target, so a dollar in, dollar out. Um, and when we go through our research process, something that we focus on within the wealth management side is making sure that this money market fund doesn't have gates and fees, which could be a factor in trying to get money out if there is some sort of a liquidity event that happens. So that's something that that we, you know, have been focused on for multiple years to make sure that in the event of um, cash flow needs alongside some sort of a liquidity issue um, that, that we'll be able to get the money out of this fund. What is the name of that fund? What does it pay and who is, I mean, like, whose fund is it? Sure. So it's Federated Hermes. Um, that's is that the, a company? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, that's the be, fund manager. Yeah. It used to be called Federated and they bought Hermes, so they merged the okay. two names. So Federated is one of the largest. Because I'm ones. familiar with others like yep. Vanguard and Fidelity. Yeah. Is, there, they is, all there, have a is there a ticker symbol for that? Sure. 
uh, G-O-T-X-X. -X. There's no A in that. Nope. For code. <laughs> <laughs> Too many letters. Yeah. So what is the yield? Uh, right around 4.7%. Yeah, so just to go back, Federate's one of the largest money managers for money markets, especially to the institutional world. While we're talking about some of that stuff, I gave you a handout, but we'll just get it on the air as well. From the MVD, uh, we're anticipating, um, we got 89,000 uh, for a couple of trucks. They've already, I think they've already spent it. They're going to be looking for reimbursement on that. And uh, they've got some other pending purchases, also from the equipment fund, uh, another three hundred forty-one thousand, and from the system development fund, uh, hundred thousand pending, and from the water fund, which is not a capital reserve, but it's a it's a savings fund, if you will, uh, probably two hundred seven thousand coming. Sometime I asked him for a timeline, but we haven't received the timeline yet. But as soon as we get that, I'll let you know. Um, and this week, after the agenda was published, we received fifty-two thousand five hundred for system development, one hundred fifty thousand for the water account, and two hundred thousand for the equipment and facilities fund. From the town. Uh, the biggest expenditure for fire equipment and ambulance, $875 for a ladder truck. I think it's a ladder, yes, Tom? No. No? Just a regular. Just a regular old truck. Only $875,000. The ladder truck costs a million five. Oh. See, I have a different perspective. When I was a selectman, it was only seven hundred. <laughs> <laughs> and an ambulance for uh, three hundred and. Eighty-five thousand. Uh, in the old days, you could buy a whole hospital for that. So those are the big things coming out of the town and the MVD. I don't anticipate any significant expenditures from the school capital reserve funds at this point. So, okay. what are the balances in that federal money market fund? I mean, it's pretty easy to hang out in that the four point seven five. Seven percent. We have uh, in the appendix. We have the as of April thirtieth. Uh, so the municipal had. I mean, cash and cash enhanced cash. Or there's some short-term bonds that are also in there. You can see in general, it's about two point seven million. Um, which one is this? This is the uh, performance. So the cap reserve. So the water district had about almost four million. Um, Again, there's some short-term stuff in there as well. So anything less than a year is is blown is categorized as cash and cash equivalents. But both are you know earning decent returns. Um, and I know there's also another question um, about what happens in the event of a you know bank failure. You know, very slow. I mean, hypothetically, if Cambridge Trust were to fail, your assets are not part of Cambridge Trust. All wealth management assets are custodied with SEI. So in the event the liquidators or FDIC were to come in, uh, it's business as usual for us. Uh, your assets are separate; they're not part of a they're not part of an FDIC liquidation. They're all custodied elsewhere. Wealth management would, would function as we would any other day. So there's no loss or anything like that. So when you talk about the five to seven year sweet spot for mm -hmm. bonds and so forth, are you buying treasuries? Are you buying corporate bonds? Are you buying some other derivative of a treasury or we're not buying, buying derivatives of true we don't we don't buy derivatives so it's mostly corporate bonds. i didn't mean derivatives as yeah. in mm -hmm. derivatives i yeah. meant like some subset well, just on like the, like the yeah. uh we'll buy u.s Army government defense bonds or something like no that. we'd buy u.s agencies treasuries and corporate bonds what we would typically buy and in that five year we're probably going to buy more corporate bonds as the yields are higher uh, you know credit spreads are still relatively attractive for high quality so you're picking up over 100 basis points in incremental yield pickup by buying a corporate over a treasury. Um, we think that's a good opportunity. You know, we would look to buy agencies, but a lot of the new issue agencies have call features. So we don't really want to buy a five-year bond and have it called away in a year. Um, we looked at buying some Amgen bonds, but very similarly, in the event that the deal doesn't go through, 
you know, according to the prospectus that, you know, the bondholders are paid at 101, which is great if you're buying it at a discount, the bonds are trading over 101. So we're not, it's the same thing as getting called, right? right. You're paying a premium over the call price and it gets called, you're going to lose money. So, right. um, so we typically, we buy more shorter agencies, moving that one to three year that have, you know, shorter calls. Um, but we're typically, if we're going out in the five year, we're buying more corporate bonds just to get the higher yields. What are some examples of the, I mean, you said Amgen, but what are some other examples of the corporate bonds that you would be buying? Uh, we have Honeywell, Amazon, Home Depot, Shell, Royal Dutch, Royal Dutch Shell, um, Salesforce. Just to give you an idea of the, you know, those are recent bonds that we've been purchasing for the portfolio. They're not like Microsoft, Apple, all of them. We would love they obviously <laughs> play less because they're higher credit quality. You're, so you're, you're you looking at yields, are almost, yeah, that are equivalent to their stock dividend yields. The yields are really low on those because right. they're higher quality. Right. Um, but you move down just a notch from AAA to AA and single A, where the you know credit quality is still really strong in our opinion, and you're picking up more yield. Um, so again, we think they're safe and sound. Home Depot, um, you know, spreads are attractive. Home Depot's not going out of business. Same thing. We're looking at possibly buying Pfizer, um, just pending a review. Again, you know, Pfizer, you know, obviously, you know, it's not AAA that it was several years ago, but their pipeline looks really robust. The M mRNA technology is now going to be utilized, you know, for cancer fighting. So we think there's a long runway there. Well, the buying. stock's cheap, too. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They're going through an acquisition right now um, for CGen. Uh, so there were some new bonds that were issued earlier this week as well. From Pfizer. Um, from Pfizer. Yeah. Um, but just following up on, on your question around Microsoft and Apple, something that we do look at um, when we're going to buy new bonds or when we're looking at valuation within the portfolio is what sort of pickup and yield are you getting from going from a Microsoft or an Apple to something that might be a little bit lower in terms of credit quality? Um, and we're, we're just finding more attractive yields in those lower areas, um, those lower credit quality areas right now. Not you're going from triple A to double A, right. but the mm -hmm. yield pickup is substantial enough to to warrant that. Thank you. Backing up, give me fifteen seconds about SEI. Sure. Sure. Which so SEI is uh, a, is a custodian. Um, so we used to use Fifth Third. Uh, we switched over to SEI. So they're you know they're a billion dollar plus custody bank to to, to what you could consider them. Um, so again, your assets are all held there, as all of our wealth management assets are. So it's very similar to you know like this, like the State Streets, you know, the, um, what are the other larger ones? Fidelity is a custody custodian bank as well. So they're all so all of our wealth management assets are not on the balance sheet of Cambridge Trust, and that's by law. Um, you know, we can't. They're not. So if, if for whatever reason, let's just say, you know, we were closed your assets are safe, secure, it's business as usual for us, for the wealth management division. And we pay them, or you pay them some sort of fee for that? Correct, yeah, it comes out of the management the fee. ranges? I don't have that information. Okay. Um, okay, moving on. Liz, did you have anything? No, uh, here we go. I had my question answered, thank you. Again, I can go through, um, you know, this just shows you some of the town account, the, the uh, capital reserve portfolios, um, the village water district, again, that has about $4 million in, in cash and cash equivalents. Um, just looking at some of the, you know, those. Sure, so just, ahead. just back up real quick. 15 sure, seconds. Sorry about that. So it looks like we got plenty of liquidity for all these expenses that we laid out. And at some point we need to tell you the timing on them because if we're we have opportunities to improve our yields or whatever, then you, you got to have that information. But at this point, you know, I'm not sure how much you should be redeploying things out of money markets until we know what the timing is on. Yeah, at the same time, money markets, if the Fed pause or has another 25, you know, short rates, and there's also as the debt ceiling will eventually get passed, the Treasury is going to issue about a trillion dollars in T-bills, which is going to drive short rates even higher. So, you know, that's where the money market's investing. And, you know, they have, typically have an average maturity of about 30 days. So you'd look, money market rates could go higher. Um, the only thing would be if we could lock in if the yield curve continues to invert, you know, moving out to that three-year. Um, sorry to keep bouncing around, uh, but this just shows you here um, the chart. 
Um, so you can see, you know, the CD level, you know, for or, or treasury yields now at three months are 5.2%. Move up to three years, you, you're losing, but you're locking that in, right? So you're locking that in for longer. So if there, if there is at some point a slowdown, you know, and the bond market is correct and the Fed cuts rates a year from now, then, you know, short rates would come down as you have a re-steepening of the curve. And more than likely, these rates would be lower as well. So there's that's that the opportunity cost of giving up a higher yield to lock in a lower yield for longer to play the, the event that we do see a slowdown and the Fed has to cut rates. I think on your question, Bill, we're looking at a, maybe help me out, Tom, two years out on the fire trucks? Two to two to three. Okay. Um, uh, and the at ambulance is probably more of a two-year uh, build. Uh, the fire engine itself is probably closer to three years. So, I mean, we typically, uh, if you look at the last few years, uh, we in June of every year, we um, request reimbursement from the capital reserve funds in the $2 million range. This year's actually going to be a little less than that. Okay. Um, the one that we're getting prepared to do in the next couple of weeks looks like it's going to be more like a million five. Um, I would expect uh, next year um, to be somewhere in that million five to two range. And then as we get out and some of these big items start to hit the ambulance, the fire engine, um, we have the potential to, to have those uh, amounts increase beyond the $2 million maybe to the, the $3 million neighborhood. Okay. So the fire truck and the ambulance would probably be coming out in the same June time frame as the, the typical? Um, the, the ambulance, I would say definitely, whether we'd do something different, we don't even know when we'll get the, the fire engine. So if it's, if it's close enough, if it's close enough to that June time frame, we probably wouldn't do anything different. If mm -hmm. it's, you know, if we have to pay for it in July, um, and we've already submitted the request, we may, we may do a, a special request at, at that time, but it all depends on, on when it rolls off the assembly line. Understood. Just, um, as, as we get closer, just let yeah. us know and we can make sure that the liquidity is available. Great. The purchase of something like the fire truck is tiered in a way. So we don't have to give them any money now, even though we order the truck. Right. But as we move along in the process and it gets more and more customized, uh, we reach a point where they want money up front. And three to six months notice on something like that. Is that right, Tom? That, I think that's, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, so we're not caught flat-footed, but yeah. uh, just you, we need to know that it's there and, and or, or you need to know that we're coming to it. So that's all. Um, so just quickly, I want where we left off on the performance here, just to show you the, um, the principal account, um, just to show, you know, the, the equity ratings of equity weighting is about 63% and about a year and a half ago, that was in the mid 70s. So you can see how we've reduced the equity weight and we did add more to the bonds to increase the overall yield of the portfolio. Um, and just to show you highlight at the bottom here over the last 12 months, you know, the portfolio was up 4.25%. So Again, you know, considering the volatility in the markets over the last 12 months, you know, the portfolio has performed very well. Um, and you can see year to date, you know, it's up 2.5% and trailing three years, you're annualizing just over a 10% return and over the last five years, um, an, eight, an eight plus percent return. And just show you the same thing on, on the common trust fund for income, um, equity weighing is about 54%. Um, again. That was in the mid '60s, back about a year and a half ago. So we have just to show you the trends that we've we've put in place. Just because it has a lower equity weighting compared to principal, you can see the returns just a little bit lower. So there wasn't a much as much in stocks compared to principal. Um, and just to show you, you know, the school district again, plenty of liquidity in the portfolio, about three quarters of a million dollars. Um, the last one, the scholarship account, again, about sixty. 6% in stocks, um, rest between stocks and bonds. This portfolio is a little bit different on the bond side, uh, just due to the size to get diversification. We're, we're using mutual funds in lieu of individual bonds. 
But again, very similar, very similar performance uh, to the other portfolios. And the last one, Quimby, uh, this has a policy limit not to exceed 50% stocks or about 44% the, bal the balance between bonds and cash. And in this portfolio, due to its size, we're just using, uh, we're using mutual funds as well. So that 0.22 return is accurate? Correct, yeah. It's in the Schwab e dividend ETF, so it's a little bit lower than the active management that we're doing in the other portfolios. Any questions on the portfolios? Not, not for you, but is that a concern that there'd be just a point to, to isn't the, does that negate like our, I mean, our, isn't our strategy to get to like 3%? Is that a concern for this? The portfolio started back in 2021. So it's a okay, shorter, so maybe that's, okay. it's a shorter period. Um, again, a lot of the volatility, but you can see, you know, just the timing, you know, last year, you know, the portfolio actually outperformed actually underperformed down about 3%. That's just the timing of okay. when the money was invested. And again, it's it's more in a dividend-focused ETF versus the broad market S&P 500. Thank you. Which ETF is it? Uh, the Schwab Dividend ETF. SCHD. Yep, correct. <clears throat> All right, that's all of our written and prepared comments. Happy to answer any questions on the markets, the portfolios, anything in general. We're probably taking up more time than normal when you got No, it's fine. No. You're not rushing to get back. They're waiting for the mall to open because no sales tax. <laughs> Let me just take a look here at the other stuff we had on the agenda. I think we're excuse me. I don't see anything else that we had anything uh exciting i did notice earlier that i sent you some those three checks from uh the village district you'll probably get those today or tomorrow uh, i sent them to the same address to suite 201 i think it was oh, okay. when does the mail address actually change uh it's officially already changed but we've still got forwarding order going on so 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 did you close did you close the branch that was over by Trader Joe's? No, 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 that's still open. Yep. Oh, you just moved on Elm Street? Is yeah, that the deal? Correct. Went from second floor to fourth floor, is that moving on up? Yeah. Those are the those are the better seats for the Fourth of July fireworks. Right. If you're on that side of the building. All right, so we should send suite 401 from now on, is that right? 400. 400, okay. Is that more space? Is that expansion or just better view? <laughs> more space, but we're kind of bursting at the seams. Because I kind of thought we were going to get, you know, an open house and the bacon wrapped shrimp and stuff. I haven't seen anything of that. I think that's in the works. Okay, we'll watch for it. Including the bacon. Okay, Liz, Tom, Bill, anything else? I'm good. I'm good. Thank good. you. Do you have anything else for us? I don't know. Do you have anything, Lindsay? No, I don't. Lisa? I don't think so. We're looking forward to the June 30th year end, fiscal year end, and uh, filings. Um, the revised MS-10 filings are significantly simpler this year. All we're doing is submitting a, an annual statement um, of the account, so it makes life easier. And uh, that's it. So. Is that going to change the timeline when we get that stuff by mid-July? Uh, yeah, we should still have it. Mid-July, I think. Okay. Oh, uh, speaking of that summer type activity, 
in mid-August, we re-examine the investment policy. Correct, yes. And, That's and right. renew it every year. So if you have any input on that, I think we're pretty good. Uh, but if you have any input on that, uh, in terms of the, the rebalancing that we've been talking about today and yeah. anything else moving forward that you think I think we made a we lot need to know. We'd, we'd appreciate that, and hopefully we'd get it in June because we don't meet in July, and that gives okay. us time to, to process going into August. But yeah, I know I we made it's... several changes about two years ago, and I think last right. year it was just a couple little minor tweaks. But, yeah, we'll, we'll review it, um, and I think everything is within you know the range of the, that the policy allows for as far as the asset allocation. Okay. Well, we'll break for 10 seconds and you can sit there and listen or we'll just move on. Uh, I do have a couple of things as we move into correspondence. I had uh, some emails back and forth with Amy Doyle at the uh, school district. She's the super, assistant superintendent for curriculum. Uh, because of COVID and whatnot, they did not run the Lego League for the last couple of years, although we've been receiving money to fund that. And uh, I'm thinking, I'll, I'll talk to Lisa about it, but I'm thinking we should be perhaps isolating that funding out. It's been just in the Watkins Fund. But uh, Amy's looking at that and, and running it. And we've also had uh, talk with uh, the school district about running the speech and spelling kind of speech hasn't been run for a couple of years again uh covid kind of bit into the plans and that goes at the middle school and there's some turnover in the administration at the middle school so that's gonna have to sort itself out over the summer next item on here and then any questions on any of that yeah. it's yeah. just routine stuff uh Flower funds. I talked to uh, Merrimack Flower Shop, and they will put the flowers out for those three graves that we have have money for. But we'd like to pay them as early as possible in June, so they deposit our check and everything is cleared up by June thirtieth. And we're meeting on June sixteenth. So what I'd like is a motion to approve paying the flower fund bill when it comes. I don't have an exact amount yet. It's usually around $120, but inflation being what it was, it might go up to 150 So, Motion to pay the flower fund bill for Merrimack florists not to exceed $200. I'll second that. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 And just, just for notes' sake, um, Dan Hawk sold the business a couple of years ago, but was still working there. And then last fall, he finally uh, retired completely. So it's under new, new management. Are they willing to deliver the flowers to the graves? Uh, they said they would. So. If you want to go out in the cemetery and take a look, you're welcome to do that. I'll, I'll go with you sometime. i got a map. Um, future meetings, June 16th. And uh, we will have a request from fun, for funds from the town at that point so we can uh, get that information to you folks for wire transfer back to the town. And nothing in July but August. 18th, and that'll be the time that we have to approve the year-end reports and sign off on the new investment policy, if or renew the existing one, as the case may be. Do we have anything else, other business that may properly come to us today? Why don't we do the um, the the forest review again? 2025 okay so it's not a yearly event no okay no um 
a couple of years ago, we talked to the forester uh, because we were hearing all kinds of things at the beginning of the pandemic right. about the huge increases in the cost of building materials. And they said, unfortunately, that's happening at the retail end, right? but it's not going to the owners of the forests. Right. So let, let the stuff grow and go from there. And we, I think we did the last harvest. I wasn't on the board at the time. I think around 2002. So 25 years. Okay. Uh, we did go out and do a site walk. 2018, does that sound right, Tom? You were there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it was Fidelity or the um, Penachuk, but they did a quite a mm. forestry job on Continental Boulevard. Yeah, it looks like it's Fidelity property. But it does, yeah. Look, look As you through. drive down the Continental, yeah, you can see where they've yeah. cleared out that whole multi-acre lot. Kind of looks nice. <laughs> Not thick forest anymore. Motion to adjourn. Second that. All in favor. Aye. aye. Excuse me, aye. Three, zero, zero. It is 9.55. A little bit.